And we're live. Um, hi there, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yes. Ma Fabulous. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, you must already be suffering from uh, budget 2022 information overload. Uh, we will probably empower you with information this evening or, or make you fatigued about a budget. I hope the former and not the latter will happen. Uh, thanks to Investec for sponsoring this webinar. Um, I am Ray Matlaka and I am with Business Maverick. Uh, I'm not flying solo tonight. Uh, there is Tim Cohen, uh, the editor of Business Maverick. Hi, Tim. Wave for everybody. Hi, Ray. That, that would mean that I would be your boss, right? You are my boss. So this makes me very happy, <laughs> <good>, Tim. <laughs> Excellent. And so then we get that clear right from the start. <laughs> right from the start. There's going to be a lot of top-down approaches. Uh, this yes, week. yeah, no, no, surely, surely. <laughs> and we have Iraj Abedian. Uh, he is also joining us. Um, he Thank is you. an economist and a familiar face uh, to the Daily Maverick community and webinars. Um, Iraj has been the economic advisor uh, to the Nelson Mandela and Tabumbeki administrations. Uh, so we are in good company in terms of institutional memory. Um, hello, Iraj. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me and greetings to everybody. Um, okay. So I just asked uh, Iraj the, the, the massively penetrating question, what is your overall view of the budget? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, Tim, the, the overall this, uh, this was a kind of Bush happy budget. Make everybody happy. Don't increase taxes. Uh, be fairly, uh, in a way, uh, practical, mechanical address with the issues that that everybody wanted. And of course, what made it very, very doable and believable is the 182 billion rand uh, revenue overrun uh, collected uh, primarily from the mining sector. We we have been and remain in a in a in a commodity boom. Uh, the, the source has become a much better machine than than in the past few years. Uh, it's regaining its old uh, operational efficiency, and that means better collection at a time that the mining companies are generating massive amount of cash. Uh, so what the minister did then uh, put a, a, a basket of it or a chunk of it for for social welfare, um, and some of it for what they call it fiscal consolidation, which means paying back debt. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the appease the, the, the financial market for reducing the debt and debt to GDP ratio, as well as debt service charges. Uh, at the same time, uh, appeasing those who wanted more welfare at a time that many millions are, are suffering from uh, poverty and, and, and dependency on, on, on annual or uh, monthly payout. Uh, from an economic point of view, I, in my view, did not uh, deal with our fundamental issues, which is how are we going to get our growth back on track? We need to grow more than 4%, between 4 and 5%, if we want to uh, to reverse the, uh, the, the decline over the past 15 years in our um, sort of annual or, or national per capita income. If we want to, to have a tax base that is on a medium to long term able to take care of our the massive uh, needs, if you want to have jobs, which means reducing unemployment, we need to deal with those structural issues. And this budget pretty much sort of bypass them, do a bit of hand waving here and there saying we will set up uh, centers of excellence and that kind of uh, feel good means nothing type of um, commitments. And for me, that was a disappointing part of it. We had a golden opportunity to do it. We desperate need to do it, but we didn't do it. Yes. That's overall impression, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Can I just pick up on your point, Iraj, uh, if, if, if I can? Um, yes about growth. For me, the most disappointing thing was that um, if you look at economic growth over the next three years, economic growth for each of those three years will actually decline and fall. 
to me, that implies that the structural reforms that uh, the National Treasury and other government head haunches have identified won't necessarily lead to economic growth immediately. Um, so for me, the growth question is something that the budget does not address. And I think for the first time, we're actually seeing evidence of structural reforms don't necessarily lead to immediate economic benefits. I'm not sure if that's something you picked up as well, uh, Iraj. Yeah. Uh, Ray, if you want to, uh, I want to unpack it on, uh, uh, in two sections. Yeah. Section one is, if you look at government's projections and right in front of me, is projecting yeah. that we're going to grow 2.4%, then go to 1.7, 1.6. Well, what are we budgeting for? We're budgeting for a declining growth rate. Uh, that is a sad, uh, sad strategy, uh, inappropriate strategy, unfortunate strategy. The second part of it, which is a reality in all economies, even if you have a growth strategy, even if you decide today I'm going to do ABC, to get the growth from 2.4 to 2.6 to 3.5, whatever, rest assured, it will take three to five years to get there. Uh, you would recall, uh, you referred to my own experience back in, uh, in 1996, 97, uh, we put a growth turnaround strategy um, and uh, it took literally six years before the economic players believed that this is going to happen before the delivery took place and then growth picked up. Um, so yes, growth takes lead time uh, and particularly when you're in a situation where we are. What are the key obstacles to our growth at the moment? Our ports are not operating, our railways are not, our network connectivities, our city infrastructure is not in place, our energy is not in place after 14 years and our water infrastructure is not growth friendly. Now, all of those, needs time for planning, needs for financial structuring, needs for implementation. And only when you do that, growth begins to respond or investment begins to respond. So yes, we have a lead time here. Uh, and uh, when I was earlier on saying that it was unfortunate that this budget did not use the time and paid lip service to it is exactly this Ray. Growth takes time to, to convince the society, the business and, and, and get the implementation going before overall business sector can respond. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, can I, for, for, can, I, can I also make a point about the the um, growth? You know, one of the things that's uh, you know, overall, I agree with you. This was a this was a you know, you know a workable a work workmanlike budget. I think uh, the um, I was really happy to see that uh, you know there was the, the government was aware that tax uh, taxes is now quite a burden on the. Um, on the society as a whole, and very careful not to increase taxes. You know, one doesn't know how long that will last, but uh, but at least there's this um, uh, really through going awareness um, uh, about um, that that we've hit the sort of maximum tax rates that we can uh, that we can hit. Um, I do have a I do have a concern about the planning within Treasury, and that links in with your point, Raj. And what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and turn it screen share on uh so this is um uh what i'm what i'm want to show if i can manage to do it is uh this is a uh the the uh, paper by ricardo Hausman and his team uh that is really about the sort of long term of south africa um uh, uh really asking the question why why has um, south africa not grown as fast as its peers around the world. And uh, I, I just thought this graph was very interesting. This is about um, the, the uh, budget forecasting. Um, and uh, it's quite a complicated uh, little graph. You can see where under my uh, cursor. Um, go from 2010, every year, government <laughs> suggests that growth is going to go up, right, the, the, over the next couple of years. The green line is the projections from that point, right? Um, and every year it went down. <laughs> so, you know, the, uh, uh, um, so the, the trajectory was downwards, but the expectation of the treasury every year was that it would go upwards. And, um, so, uh, in, and, you know, strangely enough, it, it happened in this budget too, because we were expecting a GDP growth rate of 5.1 and we're getting a, 
uh, GDP growth rate of 4.8. Um, and uh, the uh, so it's slightly less than than what we thought. So strangely enough, I'm I'm not too discouraged by the fact that uh, that uh, uh, Treasury is now kind of recognizing that uh, the, the, the structural impediments um, are not going to allow South Africa to bounce back quickly. You know, the, uh, there's a kind of comfort in that because what, what happened as, a, as someone who's followed budgets over the years uh, is that the uh, uh, government expects that growth is going to go up, right? So then they uh, um, uh, increase expenditure in line with uh, their expectation of a, uh, of a growth increase. Halfway through the year, they panic. They, because there's now a big hole in the budget. So then they do something panicky. Um, and that panicky thing in the past has been, you know, a variety of different things. One year, I remember it was plugged by a big uh, increase in the, um, in the, in, um, the petrol excise tax. Uh, one year, it was plugged by, a, you know, an increase in uh, um, uh, taxes on the in personal tax on the the highest taxpayers. You know there was some sort of mechanism had to be found very quickly so that the the the, the budget could be balanced. Um, so just to take for example that the the increase in the petrol price um, or the petrol uh, um, excise rate um, that was introduced because at that point the, the oil price was very low. <laughs> so now now the oil price is very high, and we have a real problem because uh, somehow they've got to unwind that, um, and they can't because you know the whole budget process is under pressure. Anyway, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's it's very revealing to me the Treasury um, have for so long got this so wrong. Um, it's because it means that they're not understanding the mechanics of the uh, economy as a whole. Um, yeah. And uh, and uh, I, I, I keep on looking for signs that this has changed. And uh, the fact that, uh, that they're penciling in a growth only of 1.7% next year, um, I think, I, I don't think is a terrible, uh, is, 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 I, it's depressing in concept, you know, but it's uh, as far or as structurally, I think it's uh, uh, it's a step forward. Sorry for such a long gap, but <laughs> I hope that that uh, uh, adds to the conversation. But, but I wanted to explore uh, the following because I've been watching uh, the, the response uh, to the budget. Some people have waxed lyrical about the budget, calling it good, uh, and national treasury officials have done uh, a commendable job in navigating through a difficult environment. Um, others have called it boring. Um, I guess boring is also good because it means that uh, there is some predictability. Uh, but we've had, Iraj, we've had a discussion in the newsroom about some of the, the numbers that look good in theory. Um, a lot of people might think that fiscal conditions have changed, economic conditions have changed. Uh, the fiscal crisis that Tim and I write about always, it appears that it has gone away, but the, the economic problems still remain. The structural problems um, Iraj, still remain. So, so isn't that quite a dangerous takeaway to think that uh, everything is, is uh, you know, all conditions have changed, especially economic conditions have changed when just reading from the budget? Yeah, I think that that is, uh, uh, that's where I was earlier on sort of casually referring to, to Ministers Bush happy approach. Uh, by by saying everything is good, I'm putting money into your pockets and so on and so forth. You you downplaying the very critical and and much neglected reforms that are needed that everybody has talked about. Remember, uh, National Treasury itself about eight years ago wrote a paper highlighting what type of reforms it had to be done before we want to. Uh, to, to put the growth back on track and, and arrest unemployment and so on and so forth. Um, and those are not uh, uh, within the control of National Treasury. Minister of Finance, for example, cannot uh, control uh, water planning and water infrastructure. At most, it can allocate money to it. But if the department is poorly uh, populated by incompetent people or corrupt people, the more money you give them, the less you get, except your debt goes up. The same thing with 
with uh, health, uh, with policing, and so on and so forth. So I think we need to put the context of, uh, of limitations of national treasury in the context that national treasury uh, is dependent on other line functions <laughs> to get the economy into an environment that is conducive to investment and conducive to the establishment of new enterprises. I, I sort of uh, cautiously not using job creation because job creation is the byproduct of, of investment and enterprise development. It's not a direct uh, sort of uh, factor. So be as it may, we see uh, other sim symptoms here. We see, for example, the president uh, and there is much debate in the media about it, president cause, uh, creating a parallel state uh, instead of changing the minister or the DG who is incompetent, sets up somebody else in the, in the presidency to take care of what that department should be doing, which means there is a risk here to the fiscus, which means you're paying everything twice, one for the incompetent minister and DG and the team who should get paid handsomely and not do the job. And then you have to pay somebody else to sit in the presidency to coordinate and do their job for them. And um, so, yes, we have these problems. Uh, and uh, these are uh, these are not dealing with the real issues of our economy. Yeah. The real focus of our economy requires people who understand how an economy functions, how investment in agriculture happens. What should you remove? What investment requirements are in the mining sector, and so on and so forth. And at the moment, unfortunately, neither the cabinet nor the co collective capabilities of the state are at that point. We all know that under the previous administration for almost 10 years, those capabilities were destroyed, including what Tim was referring to, the capability of national treasury to project better, to, 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 to do its financial planning better. Uh, they were destroyed. Many people were pushed out of national treasury. Uh, and and other departments. So that's the context in which national treasury operates. Yeah, Tim, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to challenge my boss here, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead. You're so welcome. Tim has been, uh, you know, overtly positive here, and uh, we we calling this webinar hits and misses um, or <laughs> lost opportunities, right? Um, I have my list right. of misses and lost opportunities. I wonder, Tim. Can you try to balance this conversation by offering your misses or or lost opportunities in the budget? Yeah, I mean the um, the um, um, I, I just can't agree more with uh, with Iraj that the, the 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 what's missing here in the budget is is a is a is a real and concrete grasp of what is required to make the the economy move. Um, um, it, you know, in a positive way. Um, you know, the, the, some things that I would have. Uh, so, you know, you, I don't. You know, it's not a. It's not a whole miss. You know, it's a kind of a half miss. I'm sorry uh, to be positive, Ray. I, I beg your pardon. The. Uh, but you know, for example, the. Uh, the I've heard uh, there's quite a lot of chat on Twitter about the decrease in um, in uh, companies tax. Um, so, and I think that, you know, I think um, uh, that's a it's uh it's crucial uh that companies tax comes down because if you um first of all we're out of range now we're we are we are sort of massively above the um average uh, um tax rate of our competitors um around the world and the second thing is that we are uh, um th th that the business confidence as a whole is terrible and it's you know it's been in negative territory now uh, um, I don't have the graph in front of me, but it's been ne in negative territory for almost a decade. Um, mm -hmm. and if you, if your business sector, which is you know seventy five percent of the economy, uh, um, is not uh, feeling positive enough to invest, um, you've got real trouble. You know, there, there are you, you are storing up real problems. Um, so it was absolutely crucial that he got that right. So what they did was they, they, uh, they've now dropped corporate tax uh, by a percentage point, which is great. Um, but they, they, they're still about five percentage points higher than um, uh, you know the, than the OECD average. Um, so um, so you know uh, it's a, you know it's it's one of these kind of things that the 
you know, the ANC does, it takes a step in the right direction and we all cheer. Um, but it wasn't really a step when you looked at it, or was it really just a shuffle? <laughs> I th the, uh, so that, that would be, um, I guess, my biggest negative. Yeah. Can I share my list? Yeah, please do. Okay. The first is, whatever happened to the urgency when it comes to dealing with the ESKIM debt question? Um, before the COVID pandemic, uh, before COVID uh, borrowed its way into South Africa, the ESKIM debt situation was considered as the biggest threat to South Africa's economy. And I'm not sure where between COVID and ESKIM debt, which is the biggest threat, but ESKIM was it. Three years later, we don't have a solution to the ESKIM debt. Is the debt, which is about 400 billion rand, um, is the fiscus going to absorb a large portion of that debt? Um, will the PRC take on the risk um, around that debt? So three years later, we have no modicum of solution when it comes to the ESKIM debt uh, situation. What worries me is the dependency on the state uh, by people through social grants. That dependency is increasing. Uh, and a scary statistic is that South Africa now pays uh, grants uh, to more than 46% um, of the population. These are people who depend on social grants for survival. Um, I wonder what the, the pool of, of, of income tax payers in South Africa looks like. My suspicion is that that pool is shrinking. So we have more people depending on, 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 on social grants, less people paying income tax in this country. Um, and again, um, the commodities cycle, the commodities boom, won't last forever. Um, so, so are we beginning to think far and wide enough about what will be the revenue drivers um, in South Africa? Um, and, and I'm afraid we're not thinking that far. Sorry to bring down the mood. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in what Irash has to say about the ESCOM question. I yeah. mean, Irash, do you, do you think it makes any difference for the, for, for the debt to sit with ESCOM or to sit with the state? Um, w w I mean, would it, would it be a, s a solution? So, so total government debt now is what? It's uh, three trillion, something like three trillion rand, right? Uh, yeah, so 4.6. Uh, 4. Uh, listen, what's a trillion between friends? What are, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Depends who your friends are. If they're the Guptas, okay. no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. um, my apologies. The, uh, but anyways, that's 10% uh, um, of the, uh, to add 10% to the national debt, uh, mm -hmm. make a difference. Um, but uh, would it, uh, um, overall, it's, it's, it's you know, it's the same part, right? Um, what do you think? Yeah, yeah I think, uh, first of all, there are two issues here. One is, uh, first of all, uh, government borrows uh, much cheaper than ESCOM. So by taking it off the ESCOM balance sheet, not the whole 400 billion, but at least half of it, 200 billion. And the reason being that is a 200 billion that is underwritten by the National Treasury in any case. So it's part of the contingent liabilities of the, the state when it comes to the rating agencies. So already it's as if government owes it. So it makes no difference, except that if you take the 200 billion, if you make it cheaper for ESCOM from a cost of borrowing. The second point that is here and, and government keeps uh, kicking the can down the road, uh, Tito Mbubeni assured us that by next year it will be done and the still is not done. The president says it's happening and the still is not happening. What is the lever that the government has in, in when it comes to unbundling of, of, of ESCOM? At the end of the day, on the table, there will be between 200 to 250 billion that has to find a home with the investors. And at that point, um, National Treasury comes and says, OK, now that you've done the right thing and so on, we will take this once and for all off, uh, off your balance sheet, once and for all, solve your problem. Or you can do it now, make it cheaper, and be a lot more uh, sort of uh, professional about getting this unbundling and, and restructuring done. Uh, but clearly there are political issues. Government does not want to take hard decisions, does not want to, 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 to put hard deadline and keeps kicking the can down the road, uh, the road 
but it makes no difference to the country. The country is paralyzed. The debt is the debt, but there is on the ESCOM balance sheet or national treasury for the country is the same thing. I would yeah. have certainly, as many others have argued, and, and, and I think convincingly argued, um, in a, including IMF, take this 200 billion that you in for in any case, yes. but give them a hard deadline that by 15th of March, you'll get the thing done and, and get the economy going and lift uncertainties. Yes, I saw, you know, it's somewhere in the, in the budget review, there's an interesting graph which shows uh, the number of um, load shedding days in South Africa. And actually, um, 2021, you know, was the South Africa's worst load shedding year. It was quite, mm. uh, quite frightening. Um, That's right. Just one thing, uh, just to, you know, I don't want to be the positive person here. Um, I, and uh, But I just want to take issue slightly with my colleague um, on, um, uh, you know, on the issue of the commodity prices and so on. I mean, I was impressed in the speech with, with how much uh, the minister was aware of, that... Um, that the, the commodity prices had given us, you know, a, a bit of a tailwind and a lucky one at that. You know, the, uh, and he said very specifically that uh, the, um, that, that's, uh, uh, that, that this was completely due to, to the, to commodity prices being high. Um, and uh, it did not mean that the economy itself had turned around. Uh, and I thought that was a great recognition. And can I, you know, while I'm on a positive theme here, can I just say something else <laughs> about uh, uh, Mr. Enoch Gondangwana? Uh, he's, um, I really liked his style. Um, I, I know it's a trivial thing, but, you know, he sort of, um, he has a, a, an enthusiasm and a casualness and a rapport uh, w that's, uh, that actually we've lacked a little bit in our sort of finance ministers. I mean, I, the, uh, when I think back on it, you know, uh, um, uh, Tito Mbeweni, uh, wonderful, thoughtful, but kind of haughty and distant. You know what I mean? I, it was my uh, the feelings about his uh, attitude. And I sort of remember all the way back to Trevor Manuel, brilliant finance minister as it happens. I mean, uh, you know, the best that we've ever had. But he was a bit of a school teacher. You know what I mean? He was always slapping everybody over the knuckles with his ruler. Um, so, you know, I, I, there were stages where, where the minister sort of got lost in his speech today. But, you know, anyway, uh, I, know, I know that is completely trivial. But yeah. uh, um, and, and also um, uh, uh, positive, uh, to, um, but, uh, but there we are. Iraj, let's do a report card of finance ministers. Uh, at, you know, yeah. Tim was talking about Trevor Manuel. Uh, I mean, you worked uh, with uh, the, 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 the Nasa Mandela and Tabombeki uh, administrations. Um, you were brought on board to be, to be the economic advisors for both uh, administrations. Uh, Nasa Mandela, and please correct my memory, Nasa Mandela presidency and Tabombeki presidency. We still, have, we still have Trevor Manuel for both presidencies, right? Well, we started with Chris Liebenberg under, under President Mandela and... Uh... Within uh, 14 months, uh, he was replaced by, by Trevor Manuel, who stayed with uh, President Mandela, followed with two successive administrations of, of President Mbeki. Yeah. Uh, and and then, your, yeah. your experiences of those both administrations, uh, did you find... Very, very, very different universe. I mean, we had really uh, 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 the most fascinating, most professional and very humble a uh, situation. Ministers coming with political directives, but sitting there to learn the technical stuff and technicians uh, doing their very best till three o'clock in the morning to get the decimal right, because it was such an excitement thing. It was about the nation. Uh, I, I think uh, those first 10 years were just magic from, from every point of view. Uh, but of course, when, when uh, uh, the administration changed and, and Trevor Emanuel was replaced by Pervin Gordon. Pervin Gordon was a populist. He just accommodated every employment, every job, uh, public service, wage increases uh, in the name of developmental state, uh, which was uh, a misnomer as we see it now. Now we're paying the price for it. Every government department is between 20 to 40 percent overpopulated. 
uh, with with the wrong uh, so-called competency, if that's the right term, even with the right uh, incompetence, <laughs> with the wrong incompetence. So, and I really, am, I'm short of word how to describe it. So, Parveen Gordon then then packed the public enterprises, packed government departments, and remember he was he was inheriting a, a fiscal surplus at that time. So he didn't know how quickly to spend. So every state enterprise was given more money that they wanted and government just uh, committed themselves to what is called non-discretionary expenditure. In other words, when you employ somebody, then you have no control over their expenditure. You just have to pay. Uh, and uh, it went on. So that, in my view, Parveen Gordon did the, the first harm to our fiscal situation, which up to today has persisted. Post that, you had uh, Nene who came to do some damage control, but that was just too late. Uh, and he got booted out. We had then uh, the weekend Minister of Finance, uh, uh, Van uh, Royen, this Van Royen. Uh, it became a joke then. It really, uh, a lot of people lost. So the ranking, uh, it peaked at Trevor Manuel, uh, and then ever since it's been on a decline. Uh, Tito tried very hard to, to get the fiscus right. Uh, he lectured us and he was absolutely right. But the politics behind him just couldn't uh, unite. The president couldn't listen to him and therefore just he didn't find it exciting to stay. He left. Uh, I would have left too. Uh, <laughs> so that is where we come from. Uh, uh, remember, under under President Mandela, we it's very uh, little appreciated how difficult the condition was that apartheid had left. It was horror of fiscal situation. Economic growth was less than half a percent, and so on and so forth. To turn that situation around with the political um, determination that President Mandela had was just phenomenal. For me, it was an absolute honor to go through it. Uh, and I'm still excited thinking about it. Uh, you know, Ray. another hit, uh, Tim, on the positive streak <laughs> <laughs> is the public sector wage bill, um, how much we compensate um, about 1.2 million uh, public servants. Um, it seems like uh, there won't be any salary increases for public servants. Um, in 2022, 2023, uh, but that depends on how vigorous uh, the trade unions fight. Um, it's astonishing. I mean, for for the 2022 financial year, we'll be paying about 683 billion rand to just pay 1.2 million public servants. I mean, that's just less than 2% um, of the population. Uh, the wage bill alone is more than what we spend every year on uh, education, especially basic education uh, uh, budgets as well. Um, so, so, so yeah. although, the, the, although uh, the, the, uh, you are paying teacher salaries, there, so you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, the uh, can I just I'll, can I just because I've now mastered the screen share thing. Can I just? Yeah. Go back to my screen share and show you another quite interesting graph. The um, uh, so um, uh, so this is uh, this this graph here is the the government wage bill prior to the budget, right? Um, so um, it shows it shows the, what what happened to the wage bill uh, um, as a as a whole between two thousand and four and two thousand and nineteen. So it's gone up, uh, um, you know, uh, what's it, sixty five percent. Um, but and the reason for that has been um, both average compensation, which has gone up uh, um, steadily, and employees, and, and the number of employees has uh, um, has increased. But this is what I thought was most interesting. This is in the um, Houseman papers again. Um, is that is where the where the employees went right? Uh, so now you you have a thirty percent increase in the uh, in the total number of employees, right? Um, and where do they go? They go to education, for example. Not so much. <laughs> do they go to, well, let's say police, for example. This is the dark green. No, the, the number of police, is, police declines, right? 
the 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 increase the big increase is in social work look mm. at that increase it's just absolutely amazing so you know um i know we kind of swapping places here um ray but i mm. um i still think that this is a big negative uh, um I, it's it's uh, i mean they don't have any choice but to recognize that uh, that public sector wages is a sort of major part of the fiscal risk um uh but um but just uh, and what they're trying to do uh is just keep a cap on wages and then sort of try to allow the situation to to uh, to right itself right uh so if you keep a cap on wages for you know uh, uh, however long they can do it uh eventually you'll get to uh, you know a sort of better proportion of the the total government spend but they're not going to that, that won't sort out the the misallocation of resources within departments um that's a uh, uh, and that's a whole different kettle of fish which you know which no one has uh, you, you know no, no one has confronted um i actually know somebody who worked in the um in the um the culture department or the, um, uh, the department of arts and culture um, and he said when he arrived th there was 100 people in the department um, when he left there was about 400 people in the department and they 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 had exactly the same job you know they the, 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 their mandate hadn't increased at all and 80% <laughs> of the work was done by uh, by organizations who, who were you know who were tasked outside of government who were tasked mm. with actually doing the job i mean it was uh, um it's sort of kind of ludicrous um so y you know the the it's it's a step in the right direction um that they are confronting the issue of the public sector wage bill um and you know i can't I, you really my heart goes out to uh, to the people in the public sector who are doing it are doing a great job because there's a lot of them um and uh the um but uh, um and and they they are really working for the country you know what i mean if you look at what their salaries actually are they they, they are they are putting aside their own personal um well-being in favor of the country so you know i don't want to uh, uh um i don't want to i don't you know this i don't want to denigrate them in any way um um uh but uh, but i think just putting a cap on the the total wage bill um doesn't doesn't completely solve the problem um i mean it is brave of him i think um i think objectively you have to say that uh, you know to to in a context in which inflation is probably increasing and is around 5% or something um the, uh, the the every year that goes by um people's salaries are effectively going down by 5%, right? If we have an inflationary environment. So uh, so things are getting tougher for public servants. Um, and uh, the um, and and th that is not a good thing. And it's politically a risk, by the way. Um, but uh, um, but it doesn't seem to me, I don't, it may be happening behind the scenes, but it doesn't seem to me that, that there's a complete strategy here. Mm -hmm. Tim, you should lead the negotiations, um, the salary negotiations on behalf of trade unions representing public servants. By the way, those negotiations for salary adjustments for this year, they start next month. Um, so a showdown is, is quite expected. Uh, should we bring other people in? We're getting comments. Um, John, yes, let's, see well, let's try and answer some of these questions. Yeah. John and Caesar brings us back to the social grant uh, uh, topic or question. Uh, John says, how long will the social relief grant uh, be sustainable, uh, given the number of uh, employed people who contribute towards tech, tax is less? Uh, so again, bringing up concerns about that, that seemingly shrinking uh, pool of income tax uh, payers. Um, is this sustainable, Iran, do you think, the social relief grant uh, in, in the context of you know, uh, the pool of income tax payers potentially shrinking or shrinking? I think it's not sustainable on two fronts. One, uh, as the minister also pointed out, that uh, social grants are sustainable only if they are financed by the tax, by the additional taxes that the economy generates. We've had a long discussion why the growth is not addressed, which means the tax base is not expected to grow, it's, it's declining. So on that front, we have a risk. 
But the second part, no less important, is the level of, of, of current uh, emergency payment of 350 rand is below food poverty, never mind being sustainable for the dignity and, and livelihood of those who receive it. So I think we have those two problems. It's not sustainable on the humanitarian, if you like, social welfare side, nor is it sustainable on the revenue side. We need to address the two sides differently, and we haven't done that. Mm -hmm. um, another yeah. maybe. Sorry, Ray, go ahead. No, no, Tim, it's okay. <laughs> No, I just wanted to uh, um, uh, address Leon Ostasen's question about uh, the wealth tax. Um, yeah. You know, I, 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 um, it wasn't mentioned in the budget, and um, I think it's gone. I mean, I just don't think they, the, the, um, um, I mean, I, I might, I, you know, I don't have any particular insight into this, uh, uh, but uh, but uh, the problem with a wealth tax is is not that it's not just and uh, and that. Um, you know, it's uh, it might help. You know, the 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 problem is that the implementation of it is fantastically difficult. I mean, essentially, what you have to do is go and establish the wealth of every single person in the country, and a treasury just doesn't have that uh, um, facility. Uh, you know, to to uh, to accurately, and of course, you know. <laughs> um, by the way, um, very rich people, you know. <laughs> That they don't put their, their money in one country. You know, the, the, uh, it's very difficult to establish somebody's uh, um, wealth. Um, so uh, um, I don't think it's feasible, and I think government recognizes that. Um, they did have a proxy for uh, the wealth tax when they, when they increased, uh, uh, when Provin Gordon, I think it was in 2018, increased the tax on the, the, um, on the highest tax brackets. I think he added an extra tax bracket. So uh, I think they've gone as far down that road as they can, and uh, they recognize it. Yeah, or, or maybe the focus now, Tim, is, is the basic income grant. Uh, you know, the, the wealth tax has died down, and now we're focusing um, on much more targeted um, social relief measures. And by the way, Iraj, where do you sit on the big debate? Um, can we afford it? Do we need it? But uh, basic income, yeah, yeah we, um, I've, I'm on record to say basic income grant um, is something that we can't afford not to do it, <laughs> given the level of poverty, given the level of unemployment and dependency. However, you cannot slap it on top of everything that we have. We got to do two things. One is to get the tax base uh, which requires a growth rate of 4 to 5 percent so that from the tax base we, we introduce a basic income grant, not from borrowed money. That will be a, a, a road to disaster. The second thing that we need to do is to make judgment on what type of expenditure we want. Uh, for example, do we want a cabinet as big as and as richly paid as what we have now, because that will impact on how much our taxes can afford to provide the basic income grant. If you look at our country at the moment, between the cabinet, the nine provincial administration, between all the MPLs, meaning local uh, councillors and so on, and provincial, the amount runs into billions, billions, literally. In my books, they got to cut it by 60%, literally, and nominally in terms of allocation of expenditure, and then put that into the financing of a basic income grant, which is in line with the dignity of families, food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a complex exercise, requires really a complete uh, mindset change on the part of political leadership. Yeah. Um, are we there yet? I don't think so. Sure. And Tim, we, 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 we always debate this in the newsroom about whether yeah. it's you know, something we need. Um, and you've got very interesting views. No, no, no. I, I, um, I agree with you, Raj. I, I, I just don't... Uh, I, um, um, I think it would be fabulous to have a, a basic income bar. Um, but but in, in, introducing it has to be uh, part of a much larger package. Um, yeah. I think that's obvious of uh, of reforms everywhere down the line, right up and down the. Um, and and I just don't think those reforms are ever going to happen. You, you know, it's uh, 
there's such a political change and such a political risk. I just don't see the the the, the uh, political will there. Can I just you know one of the questions uh, was about um, about uh, um, corruption and uh, uh, this is the question from John Roberts. The um, and I just wanted to make one point which I thought was very interesting and this is a positive point again. I'm sorry, Ray. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the. Um, uh, the, the minister did in, in, announce today very big increases for for some of the branches of uh, of um, uh, investigation in the and uh, and um, uh, policing. Uh, I mean, really substantial uh, um, increases in budgets for uh, uh, for things like the NPA and um, for parts of the investigative units of police. The uh, so uh, I think he, you know, I th uh, my. My guess is that's a personal thing. You know, he just thought this was very important and he, he was in the position to give them a good um, pump and did. Uh, and I, I think that re really reflects on him really well. Um, the, uh, whether or not they'll get the cases out is, is, uh, um, and whether we will get um, a uh, post Gupta dividend, as John was saying, I, you know, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, the, the, um, <laughs> The um, the problem is that the the uh, um, uh, you know the, the the payments that were made the biggest payments that were made in both the the case of Escom and in the case of Transnet um, you know, they were they were paid to companies outside the country um, yeah. you know you have to, then now you're talking about international law um, the uh, uh, I I doubt that we'll I I think that you know if if uh, if we can if we can get a government that is uh, that really seriously doesn't want to go down the corruption route, uh, th that will be its own dividend. You know, that could be its own dividend. But as far as getting the money back from the Guptas, oh, good luck. I, 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 I hope, but uh, I wait. Yeah, I mean, as an anecdote, um, I had a very interesting conversation with a government official. Um, you talk about the we talked about the Zonda Commission, and this government official says most public servants, um, some people in the law enforcement um, agencies, have not even read the Zonda report, not even part one of the Zonda report. So, and journalists have worked through it quite diligently, whereas, you know, the decision makers haven't really engaged with the report, which is quite worrying. Um, but Avril Ryder um, says, I was unable to listen to Enoch's uh, budget speech today, and therefore curious to know if there was uh, any further incentives or tax relief uh, for small businesses. Um, not really, um, Avril. My memory says um, the only relief offered to small business businesses is the, the increase in the incentive. It's called the Employment Tax Incentive. Uh, which sort of gives rebates, uh, tax rebates to uh, businesses that hire uh, uh, young people. Um, and I think that that uh, that incentive will increase from about 1,000 Rand to a maximum of 1,500 Rand uh, per month in the first, I think, 12 months. Uh, that's as far as, you know, the sort of tax relief measures go uh, regarding um, uh, small businesses. Uh, yeah, there, was, there, was one, there was one other thing. There was also a, a provision for a um, uh, for, for a small business loans uh, scheme, which which yeah. isn't fully formed yet. Um, it, it came up in the the Cerna speech too. Um, the um, and you know I think this is a this was a big problem because a, a lot of countries around the world during the COVID process um, did quite a lot to, to to support businesses that were at risk, um, <laughs> and uh, the um, the, uh, the, the and the southern government actually tried to do that, um, but there was something wrong with the mechanism. Well, there was a lot of things wrong with the mechanism, obviously, because uh, as you remember, it was originally a five hundred billion uh, um, rand commitment, and uh, and the take up was was minuscule. Ray, you you wrote this at yeah. length, if I recall. Um, the um, so so th there is a, there's a a version two of that. Which was announced in the budget too, which uh, and we'll we'll look to see how those um, uh, how how that plays out. Yeah, and version uh, I think version two is Ray, Ray. version one. No? 
Ray, just uh, also important to, in response to that, government has allocated a 20 billion fund to support the SMEs in terms of their first loss, and it's going to be channels through, uh, call it uh, specialized vehicles, not the banking sector, because the banking sector is not fit for them. And yeah. um, that sounds very good, but uh, if I ask how many of these alternative parallel structures do we have that are going to be more effective than the banking sector, I, I, I don't know who they are. I know over the past 25 years, we've put uh, uh, Kula Foundation and Insika and all of those, which meant to, to be favorably lending to the and supporting SMEs, both of those initiatives have failed uh, and, and government lost the money. So, uh, but at least from a political point of view, they have allocated 20 billion rand to support the SMEs. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. I'm going to run through the comments. We've left, left about we left with about eight minutes uh, for the discussion. Uh, Paul Hoffman, uh, technically, it is possible to rake back uh, loot of state capture. There is just no political will to do so. Uh, Paul, again, Tim. The NPA is broken. Reform uh, is required more than uh, an additional budget. Um, and uh, Mario says, yes, we have heard much talk about acting against corruption, but not one single, even low key transgressor has been charged or sentenced. Uh, perhaps the sooner all options run out financially, the better. Ooh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> um, uh, Suresh Bika, lifestyle orders will rake in billions via uh, a wealth tax on all individuals whose assets are over, say, 10 million rand. Uh, they must pay tax at 50%. Yeah, a lot of tough people here. <laughs> um, that's as far as the comments go. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make, I mean, there was, the, um, you know, one of the things you were talking earlier, Ray, about things that you, that we should have seen but didn't. Um, you know, one of the things that I was expecting uh, was a um, uh, was um, was a rethink of uh, um, the BEE rules. Um, you know, because uh, government has um, several times now uh, um, wanted to hand out um, you know support to small businesses. Um, especially BE businesses, um, and uh, there have been a series of court cases which government has lost, um, really because the the it's you know it's very complex to do because you know you've got to define exactly what a black business is, the uh, and that varies, and uh, the um, uh, and the courts are insisting that government uh, um, has a clear policy on this, which they don't. Um, so. Um, uh, um, I, that wasn't mentioned at all, um, and uh, I do think it should be because if, if government wants to intervene to support business, the um, the basis on which it does so really has to be very clear because otherwise it's going to be caught up in another set of uh, you know corrupt um, transactions. Um, and the the uh, but you know you know my my overall impression is that uh, that that's, uh, you know there's quite a lot of institutions. That, that support business in South Africa or support the creation of, of businesses. Um, the, you know, this, uh, uh, we have endless sort of development organizations that do this. Um, and, uh, um, but it doesn't help to have, you know, government ready to sort of hand out loans to people who want to start businesses. If your, uh, if your knowledge and understanding of business is poor. Um, and I think that's, that's, it's it's really the the um, uh, the, the our, our our level of overall appreciation of, of economics is uh, is low, and 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 uh, I'm I'm as as guilty as as uh, as all South Africans on this issue. I'm afraid, <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. You know, we need to we need to do more to establish a business business culture in South Africa, and I don't mean a you know the we should be more pro pro business. You know, it's just about the mechanics of doing business uh, that we need to uh, um, insert into our into our education system in a way that you know is fun and interesting, 
puts yeah. really puts people in a position uh, to innovate off their own bat. Yeah, Iraj, I'm coming to you next. I just want to read Hendrik's uh, comment. I'm going to ask you about what next from here. So we have the budget. What should the, the, the priority focuses be going forward? And Tim, you can also have a bite at that very quick. Um, Hendrik uh, says what happened uh, with the debate of early access to pension fund money. Uh, my understanding is that that process is still stuck in white paper, green paper, research, you know, South Africa has too many research processes going on, but the government is still interrogating the process of of early access to pension fund uh, savings. Uh, Iraj, what next? Very quickly, uh, what should the priority focuses be going forward? I think going forward to me is uh, what the minister calls it, establishing private public sector centers of excellence in terms of investment and provision of infrastructure. That's an area that is critical, and especially for media, given that we're talking to media at the moment, uh, it's so important to keep the focus on that and keep the government accountable to it. Um, mm -hmm. To me, that's where we, we, we have to find ways of overcoming the inefficiencies of public sector uh, and lack of accountability through partnerships. Uh, and the sooner we do it, the sooner we get the things done. Mm. Can I offer my next term before you yes. have the last one? No. I don't know what the next is. Um, I look at the unemployment crisis. Uh, we used to think that we need economic growth um, alone uh, to make a dent into the unemployment crisis. But the problem is that South Africa, I mean, unemployment is so structural. Uh, people don't have the right skills for a modern economy. Uh, people don't have access to opportunity. People live far uh, from opportunity. So having economic growth alone it's just not enough to make a dent into the unemployment crisis. I would suggest that we have to be, we have to accept that unemployment will be here for quite a while. And uh, it's a sad state of affairs, but unfortunately that's where we are. Uh, Tim, you have the last bite. Um, well, I would just say as a general rule, South Africa should embrace the future much more than it's doing so at the moment. Um, you know, just as one example, there's a thousand million examples of this, um, but it's shocking to me that, that there is no government uh, encouragement of electric cars in South Africa. I know that we have problems with ESCOM, that's obvious, um, but, but you know, it, the, uh, this is a major change, a structural change that is happening in a major industry, and for us to be behind the curve on this, just to me, is just uh, stupid. It's just stupid. And, uh, you know, it's, it reflects a, a very kind of uh, um, sort of uh, I internal uh, um, focus uh, not, uh, and not a sort of appreciation of, of uh, sort of the, the, the global trends. Um, you know, the, uh, I, I saw recently that uh, Turkey, so, you know, Turkey's been in all kinds of economic trouble, right, uh, for the past uh, uh, years they're in a much worse state than we are in some senses. Um, it's a richer society, but you know the. Uh, um, but what they did was they got the three biggest companies together, and uh, and said your job is to, to develop an electric car, you know, uh, and they've now developed the electric car. And who knows whether it's, you know it'll be a white elephant or not? Uh, but it, the um, the uh, and and you know the same thing is true of. Uh, artificial intelligence of, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, sort of new medicines. South Africa has, uh, um, you know, made some progress there. But anyway, my, my, my overall uh, uh, hope is that uh, that government stops worrying about politics in a narrow sense and starts thinking about politics in a global sense. Mm. Erica agrees with you. Here, here, Tim. We should all look after our planet in, in response to your comment uh, about embracing electric cars and, and technology on that front. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you so much for staying with us through the technical problems, on mostly on my part. <laughs> but uh, Tim Cohen, my boss, thank you so much. Iraj Abedian, economist and a friend, I think, now to Daily Maverick. Thank you so much, everybody, and take care. Hey? Thank you. Bye-bye.